Yeah, she's like, I don't think I was ready to be. What does that mean? It means that you're not going to be able to talk or anything. He'll probably just talk and you listen. So he's recording it for future use so you can go back and watch some of his past videos. And I'm sure he's going to like mute all of you guys. So you're just watching it. Then he'll upload those and so you can go back to his page and watch him. I mean, if you even just go on LinkedIn for nothing more than him, it might be worth your Okay, let's get started. So I want to thank everyone for being here. It's really nice to have you guys all here today. This talk is being recorded. It's at 1230 on a Saturday Eastern. So I think most people who watch this tend to watch it after the fact. But we did want to have this talk live so there could be questions for people who want to ask questions literally about any tumor. But today we're really focusing on breast cancer. But really any tumor that you want to talk about, we can talk about after. So Today we're going to talk, it's basically titled, "If you were, this is the If You Were My Family Member series. This is episode two of stage four breast cancer. Really today we're going to talk about treatment, but you will find that what we talk about today is broadly applicable to a lot of individuals who have cancer in other disease states. So hopefully you can take some of this with you. Please go to episode one of this series. That was really an overview of stage four breast cancer, but there was really an overview in that regarding molecular profiling right? And how we decided people are candidates for immunotherapy. That particular part of the talk is universally applicable for the most part. So please go to that. I will be doing every stage four cancer in time. So we're going to finish up with stage four breast cancer really in the next one or two episodes. And then we will turn our attention to stage four colon cancer, stage four lung and the like. I've had several requests to do those sorts of talks and we absolutely will be doing that. This particular series will focus on stage four malignancy. That's something I think that I do relatively well. And I'm, you know, I consider myself very good at precision medicine. And that's something that you'll see me talk about a lot. So audience participation is absolutely encouraged. That's why I'm holding this live. You know, I could easily just record these and put these online, but this is really a live session so people can ask anything they want to ask about any case they have, and I will answer your questions to the best of my ability. If you want to see my record, please go to LinkedIn. You know, it's just not all that useful to talk about it here. It would take a little while. Just go to LinkedIn and you can kind of see. So when we talk about stage four breast cancer, this is a slide that you could see from episode one. You know, we kind of stage breast cancer zero, one, two, three, four. There are definitely subtypes, but the idea is that breast cancer starts in the breast, right? It goes to the axillary lymph nodes, so the armpit lymph nodes, and then goes out. So stage zero slash one breast cancer restricts the breast. Stage two, three, larger breast tumors, oftentimes in the lymph nodes. And then stage four is where it has spread to other organs. It has a predilection for going to bone, which we'll talk about in a second. So this talk is really fixated on patients with stage four breast cancer, right? This is kind of what we're talking about today for the most part, but I promise you that some of the concepts will be universally applicable. So let's just start with the overlying methodology and the overlying thought process I have regarding cancer in general. Listen, for I fundamentally believe, and I will say this a million times out of a million times, that no two cancer patients are the same. No two stage four colon cancer, KRAS mutated, MSI high patients are the same, although that'd be a rare sort of situation, but no, no two of those patients are the same. No two stage four triple negative breast cancer patients are the same. Every breast cancer patient is different. And the idea is that they have different protein expression profiles, different molecular profiles, different amounts of tumor burden, right? Where your cancer is located matters. The amount of cancer you have matters. These things don't transpire in a vacuum. You have to look at the, the entire case globally, and you have to appreciate that no two cancer patients are the same. Today, we're talking about breast cancer, but that is a universally applicable statement. People need to stop thinking about cancer patients as though they're the same. They are intrinsically heterogeneous. There's essentially no homogeneity in cancer. They have different locations of metastases, different patterns and growth of response, and really cancer biology, the tumor biology matters. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are some patients who have cancers that you would think would be normally aggressive that are relatively indolent. They're slow growing, right? And there's something about those cancers we just don't understand, right? We don't know why a stage four breast cancer patient, say ER, PR positive, HER2 negative, 
has a very fast growing tumor that doesn't respond to a lot of treatments, which would be rare, but happens versus another patient who's just disease that just sits there. There are some stage four lung cancer patients that we can just watch because their disease doesn't move, which we would never have thought of doing years ago, right? But there is something happening inside everyone's cancer that makes it unique. So when I'm thinking about someone's cancer, I'm not thinking about just today, right? It's not just a snapshot. I'm trying to get a feel for their tumor biology. What is it about their cancer that's unique? How fast does this thing grow? How does it respond to various treatments? Which treatments does it respond to? Where is it located? Is there a mixed response? Is there one area that looks different than another? I'm thinking literally about thousands of things in my head because I'm trying to understand my patient's specific tumor. I don't ever, ever, ever think about patients as homogeneous. I think that if you have cancer, please, please, please understand that you have cancer. It's your cancer. It's no one else's cancer. I don't care what people tell you. Yes, you can try and generalize from the literature. When you have stage four colon cancer, you want to read about what's out there. Yeah, you have to kind of read about stage four colon cancer, but appreciate that your situation will always be unique. You will always be different. You're not a number. Cancer does not read a textbook. It doesn't care about what I predict should happen. It does not care, right? You are an independent person and your cancer is distinctly different. Not to mention, right, even with respect to all of your cancer characteristics, we still have to think about you, right? So your cancer may be different than someone else's in terms of where it's located, how much cancer is out there, what the profile is, but think about the fact that you're going to be different too. You have different comorbidities, so different medical issues you may have already had. You're taking different medications. You have a different genetic composition. So not only are your cancers different, but they're superimposed on an entirely different milieu. That's you, right? It's a different environment entirely. So please, please, please recognize that no two cancer patients are the same, period. So what are we doing with this series? Well, this series is completely free. I'm not monetizing this. I'm literally doing this every week. It takes a lot of time, but I'm trying to convey my heart and my mind in this series to really give you a feel for what I would want to know if I was, if you were my family member, if you were my loved one, I was sitting in the room with you and I was you know, trying to figure out how to optimize your situation. And I had questions for the doctor, some phenomenal oncologist that you had. This is what I would be thinking about for you, right? I would want you to get cutting edge care. So how do I make sure you get cutting edge care how would you ask the right questions at cutting edge care? I'm sure your oncologist is going to give you cutting edge care anyways. But if you're here, then you want the information, you want the education, you want to be able to advocate for yourself. And it's important, right? So this is important for advocacy through knowledge. It's rooted in empathy, right? So I think probably my best characteristic as a person, my parents would say this, and so I hope I'm not bragging here, but I do think I'm I'm very good at understanding or trying to understand what people go through. I think that was something I was born with. You know, I just feel when people hurt. You know, I've had many, many of my mentors told me that I would burn out very quick because they just couldn't understand how I could feel the way I can feel, but it's just the way it's the way it's always been. Right. I just, I uh, care a lot. I treat everyone like their family. They all have my cell phone. All my patients have my cell phone number. You know, it's not rhetoric. It, for me, it's a lifestyle. Like it's, it's something that you do every day. You know, I feel like for my patients, I can't just be there when things are good. I feel when things are bad. And in fact, that's when they need me the most. So all my patients have my cell phone number. And this series is entirely rooted in that concept. And we're trying to optimize, optimize outcomes through making you a better patient, right? The more you know, the more you understand about what's happening to you, the better patient you'll be, I promise you. The more you can anticipate the future, the more you can think about what the next step should look like, the better you'll do, I think, in, in terms of optimizing your outcome, or at least you'll say that you did your absolute best. And that's why you're here, right? That's why people look for education. That's why they go online. They're trying to find the best situation for themselves, trying to control as much as they can. And that's I absolutely agree with that. Try and control what you can. Try and make sure you're getting the best care. Try and advocate for yourself. Try and think outside the box. Absolutely, it's what you should be doing, particularly when you have stage four cancer, it's theoretically incurable. So let's talk about breast cancer. Now, we talked about how everybody's cancer is different. So we got to build your personalized journey, not the person next to you, not the person that you're in the lobby with at the clinic. You know, and listen, everyone's going through something, right? And it's awful, but they are not going through the same thing you are. They don't have the same family pressures you do, the same work pressures you do. They don't have the same cancer you do, and they're not you, right? So everyone's different. So we're going to build your personalized journey. That's kind of what this entire series is about, right? So let's talk about protein expression profile. Understand that if you have stage four breast cancer, everything starts with the protein expression profile. And what I mean by that is we're looking at three proteins of interest in your cancer cell. 
We want to know if your cancer makes the estrogen receptor, if it makes the progesterone receptor, and if it makes a protein called HER2. Why does it matter? Okay, well, if your cancer makes the estrogen receptor as depicted here, right, and that's in green, what essentially happens is the estrogen receptor binds to estrogen, okay, and that's here. And estrogen basically stimulates the cell to divide. So think about this very easy. Cancer is just a cell that grows in an uncontrolled way. Prostate, can, prostate cancer, prostate. Colon cancer, colon cell. Breast cancer, breast cell. It's just a cell that grows in an uncontrolled way. So in this case, if you're making a lot of the estrogen receptor, basically what's happening is estrogen's binding to the receptor and stimulating your cell to divide in an uncontrolled way. And you can see that here. It's a very beautiful depiction of this. And so you can see that here. In addition, if you look at the progesterone receptor, what transpires here is progesterone, which is another hormone, binds to the receptor and then stimulates the cell to divide. That's all that's happening here, right? So if you're making the estrogen receptor, it suggests that your cancer is estrogen responsive, meaning that estrogen stimulates your cancer cell to grow. If you're making, if you're making the progesterone receptor, similarly, it suggests that progesterone is stimulating your cancer cell to grow. And then the last protein we talk about is a protein called HER2. Now I'm intimately familiar with this protein. I studied this protein for three years in the lab during my PhD. I have published papers on this protein. I've taken care of patients for well over a decade with HER2 breast, HER2 positive breast cancer, HER2 positive gastric cancer, HER2 positive esophageal cancer, and the like. I am intimately familiar with this protein. The idea here is pretty simple. We all have this protein on the surface of our cells. We all have it, right? But in a normal cell, it's relatively sparsely distributed. What happens in a cancer cell that's HER2 positive, a breast cancer cell, even a colon cancer cell, lung cancer, bladder cancer, everyone's looking at this now, right? Salivary, gastric, esophageal, right? So what happens in those cells is sometimes they overexpress HER2. So you get too much HER2 protein shown here in blue on the plasma membrane. When you get too much HER2 protein, what happens is now these guys or girls can basically, or whatever, can, can basically homodimerize, right? And then that essentially activates a pathway that is triggered by HER2 receptor cytokine pathway. I don't go through this too much, but that can induce the cell to divide. So the idea is you make too much HER2, the HER2 protein basically signals the cell to divide, and that's what happens. You get a cancer cell that's dividing in an uncontrolled way. So we very much want to know if you make estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2, if you have breast cancer. Now, that's also true. We want to know if you make HER2 if you have colon cancer. We want to know if you make HER2 if you have lung cancer. Like this is an important protein. And so we want to know. Now, when we talk about the estrogen receptor, when we talk about if your cancer is positive or not, the way we define if your cancer, your breast cancer, is estrogen receptor positive or not, is we stain the cell for an antibody that recognizes the protein. Okay. So we can stain it and we can say, okay, how many of the cancer cells have this protein, right? And so if it's 1% or more, that's considered positive, just 1%. Only 1% 1 of the cells have to make this protein for us to say you're estrogen positive. Okay. Now I want you to appreciate something for a moment. If your cancer is 1% or more positive, that's 1% I mean, of the cells make the estrogen receptor or more, that's considered positive, but it's really low positive. If you're between one and 10%, that doesn't matter too much but it's a little important, right? Because if we're targeting, using a treatment to try and target estrogen, if your cancer really isn't that dependent on it, because not a whole lot of cells make it, that's a little bit of a challenge, right? It suggests maybe you will not respond to the treatment. That's just something to keep in your back of your, back of your head. It doesn't really have any significant clinical implications. But similarly, if you look at progesterone, right? Again, for us to say your cancer's progesterone receptor positive, all you have to do is have 1% of the cells be positive, just 1%, 1% or more. Again, if you look at kind of the low PR positive, low progesterone receptor positive cells, that's in patients who have 1% to 10% of cells being positive, right? So the bottom line is you can kind of keep this in mind. And then we look at HER2 if you're positive or not. So the way we kind of ultimately classify you, right, is we say, okay, are you hormone receptor positive or not? Do you make the estrogen receptor and or the progesterone receptor? So those are hormones, right? Progesterone and estrogen are hormones. So do you make these hormones or not, right? And then do you make HER2 or not? Now there is a low HER2 designation. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, right? But the idea is we put you in a box. We put your cancer in a box if you have breast cancer. We say, okay, you make either the estrogen receptor or the progesterone receptor and you're HER2 negative. So we put you in this box. We say, okay, you make one of the two hormone receptors and you're low HER2 positive, we put you in this box and so on and so forth. If you make none of these proteins, no estrogen receptor, no progesterone receptor, 
no HER2. So you make none of the three proteins, we consider you triple negative, right? And that's depicted here. The box you're in matters. It has a huge impact on how to predict what's gonna happen to you. It has a huge impact on what your treatment will entail. Everything comes down to this box, which is why I'm starting with it. So today we're really gonna fixate on people in these two boxes. We'll talk about that a little later. In the talk in one week, we will fixate on people on, in these three boxes, and then we will end our breast cancer discussion by fixating on people with this triple negative box. So today we're talking about these two boxes. Now, with that said, it is incredibly important to know your protein expression profile like we just discussed. You can see here two patients of mine who allowed me to show these images. This is a triple negative stage four breast cancer patient. She does not make any of those three proteins we talked about, okay? She has a little bit of disease in the liver. You can see these four spots here. She has a lymph node depicted by this red arrow, okay? And she is essentially, that's essentially what her disease looks like, okay? Now compare that to this individual here that has widespread disease in her bones, okay? But she is estrogen receptor positive, receptor positive, HER2 negative. She has a lot more disease, right? There's a lot of disease in the bones up and down all this entire area, okay? So there's a lot of disease in the bones. This is actually the kidneys, these are normal. I just picked it as red arrows being normal because up and down her spine. And she actually came with significant pain in this area, okay? Now, it might look like this patient here is in a much worse situation than this patient here but that's actually not true. It's not true because the protein expression profile matters. This is a much more favorable protein expression profile. This patient is likely to do, going to do better, although I don't put expiration dates on people. I don't expect people to not do well, right? It's not how I think. But in theory, because of the protein expression profile, this patient in white here will do better, arguably, than the patient here with lower amounts of disease. In addition, another thing to, to note from this, is where your tumor is matters. The fact that this patient has a little disease in the liver is worrisome, right? When there's disease in the bone, that's a much more favorable situation than if there's disease in the organs, like the liver, like the lungs. So the fact that this patient has disease in the liver is a little bit worrisome, right? So it's not just the fact that this patient's triple negative, that's worrisome in and of itself, but it's the fact that there's disease in the liver. So you can't just look at this and say, oh, this patient looks like they have a lot more disease, they're in a worse situation. No, 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 no. You have to understand protein expression profile. It is critically, critically important. Not just that, you have to know your molecular profile. Now this is not breast cancer specific. I want everyone in this room, if you have colon cancer, if you have lung cancer, you've got to pay attention to this particular slide. It's applicable to every single tumor. And I want you to push your doctor. I want you to push your oncologist. If they haven't done the test, tell them to do the test. Tell them you want it done, okay? So here's the idea. Sometimes you have to be your own hero. Sometimes you have to advocate for yourselves. I've seen data where oncologists are not getting these tests. And I don't, I'm not seeing that personally. I think a lot of my colleagues are getting these tests. My colleagues are very smart. I'm no better than they are. But the bottom line is I have seen data suggesting that we're not doing these tests properly on patients with stage four disease. That's why I'm talking about it. So you can be your own hero. I need you to advocate for yourself. You need to say, hey, Dr. Gwilly talked about this. I, well, not even Dr. Gwilly, let me mention my name. Just say, I saw this online. I want to know what the heck is going on. Can we do these tests? And I put in green all you really need to take away from this slide. Okay. And if you want to really understand this, I want you to go to the first lecture we gave. It's on YouTube. I'm going to put it there for you. It's on the website too. Just go to the section on this. You can understand the principles. Okay. But all I really care about is that you take what's in green and you take it to your doctor and say, can we do, did you do these studies? If we haven't, can we do them? Okay. So let's talk about them a little bit. So NGS stands for next generation sequencing. Essentially what we're doing is we're taking the DNA in the cancer cell, right? And we're saying, okay, what mutations are in that cancer cell? And if there's mutations in the cancer cell, do I have drugs already available to me that can target those mutations, right? So you can see here, for example, this patient has a purple mutation in the DNA, so we can use the purple drug. This patient has the green mutations, so we can use the green drug. This patient has the orange mutation, we can use the orange drug. It's a very simple premise, right? We look for mutations in your cancer cell DNA to find out if we can use drugs that target the mutated proteins that result from the mutated genes. It matters a lot. Sometimes this can revolutionize your course. I'll show that to you in a second. But in breast cancer, it matters because there is a specific gene we look for. There's a gene called PIK3CA that is mutated in approximately 40% of breast cancer. We have a drug called Alpalisib that helps patients who have a mutation in PIK3CA. So if you are a stage four breast cancer patient that has is hormone receptor positive, okay, and is either low HER2 positive or HER2 negative, 
then you need to ask your doctor about this particular mutation. Say, hey, I don't know if you told me or not, and if you tested for it, I'm pretty sure you tested for it because every oncologist should be. What was my pick three steps? I want to understand it. We're going to show it to you a little bit later and why it matters. Then everyone has seen commercials for immunotherapy. Keytruda's on TV, Tixcentric's on TV, Opdivo's on TV, Simulamab's on TV, Dostarlamab's on TV, there's uh, Velamab's on TV, right? So there's all these drugs are on TV, okay? And so you can kind of see everyone's trying to tell you use our immune therapy. Well, what's immune therapy? You can go to the first lecture and I'll talk about it extensively. But the idea is that immune therapy is designed in development. I'm sorry, I didn't mention about it earlier. But immune, it's another immune therapy. It's also on TV. And actually, that's wrong of me to do that because I've actually talked on their behalf before. But anyways, the bottom line is immune therapy is basically treatment designed to rev up your immune system, to recognize your cancer as foreign, and to eradicate it, to attack it. Okay, That's what immune therapy is. Now, we do have a couple ways to try and decide if we think that immune therapy will work in your case. These, these ways are not great. They are suboptimal, but they are what we have now, right? So what we do is we test your cancer cell for a protein called pd one We look to see if it has a high level of tumor mutation burden. Are there a lot of DNA mutations inside it? Is there a lot of DNA instability that's depicted by microcellular instability? So that's what that means, right? We look to see if there are reasons that we think immune therapy will work in you. If you're MSI high, you have a lot of DNA instability, or your tumor mutation burden high, you have a lot of mutations, or your pd one high, it suggests you are more likely to respond to immune therapy. It's not perfect science. It doesn't always work the way you want it to. But if you are if your cancer is MSI high, if it's TMB high, if it's pd one high, you need to ask your doctor if you're a candidate for immune therapy. Now, I'm going to talk to talk to you about this a little bit later. If you're pd one high and you're triple negative breast cancer, then you can be you can get immune therapy. If you're not triple negative breast cancer, you can't. I don't want to talk too much about that. The bottom line is I don't care. What I want you to know is if you're pd one high, MSI high, TMB high, ask your oncologist about immune therapy, okay? It's hard to go through every single detail in these talks and, you know, every permutation and kind of give you everything. That's almost impossible. Every patient's different. That's almost impossible to do. I do not care about the details. What I care is about is the big picture, the forest. Ask them about NGS, ask them about pd one ask them about TMB, ask them about MSI. And if you're MSI high, TMB high, pd one high, say, hey, am I going to get immune therapy, right? The last thing to talk about is something called homologous recombination deficiency. Every cell in it looks, so, you know, all of us have stem cells that need to replenish cells as we get older, right? You have to have your stem cells or you would die. And as these cells divide, you can get mutations in the DNA. That just happens. That's, you know, there's some infidelity in the process. We have a bunch of processes in our cell that can basically say, oh, wait a second, that's a mutation. I got to repair that before that gets propagated to all the daughter cells that come from this, cell, right? And that's because that would be obviously a problem. Now, sometimes there are deficiencies in these repair processes, one of which is called homologous recombination, right? So homologous recombination deficiency can be seen in cancer cells. And if you have, if the cancer cell is deficient in this process, then you can potentially get what's called a poly ADP ribose polymerase PARP inhibitor. Again, I don't want you to get caught up in the details, okay? And HRD testing is a little bit interesting. Some people will test for it separately. Some people just do look for it in the NGS. Okay, so what I want you to do essentially is just go to your physician, take the green letters, NGS, pd one TMB, MSI, HRD. If you have stage four cancer, ask them if they tested for it and see what their answer is, okay? That's all I want from this. Don't go crazy on this. You can go to the first talk and just look at kind of a little bit more information on this. I don't want to really focus on that today. But let's talk about kind of why it matters. We'll talk about that in a second, but I'll show you some beautiful pictures in this regard. So we talked about how the protein expression profile matters. We talked about how your molecular profile matters. Let's talk about cancer burden and location. Doctors do not really talk about this with you. They should, right? The amount of cancer and where your cancer is located absolutely matters. It's a big freaking deal, right? Look at these two patients. These are two patients here, okay? This first patient on the left, right, with these arrows, they have a ton of disease. Like this is all disease in the liver, right? It's crazy amount of disease. There's disease up and down the spine. There's disease everywhere, right? These are melanoma patients, by the way, not, not cancer, not breast cancer, just using this as an example. This is a stage four melanoma patient, okay? Now look on the right. Here's a patient who's also stage four melanoma, okay? But they only have a single lesion in their right lung. That's right here in this yellow circle, right? Those two patients are not the same, right? But yet they still are considered stage four melanoma, right? They both actually have BRAF, B600E mutations, so they have the same molecular profiles to some extent, right? So if you're talking to an oncologist and they're describing these two patients to you, they're saying they both have stage four melanoma. That's what they're saying. When you read the report, 
They have the same exact designation on the report. They're both say, being told they're stage four melanoma. When I read the report, say I get an oncologist who's sending me a report, just maybe a patient's transferred their care to me because they moved or something. The patient, all it says is stage four melanoma. I can't, I don't know the difference between this. It's only when I look at their pictures that I fully understand what their stage four melanoma is. This patient on the right, this patient with this single spot, that's a very different patient. That patient, I might just pick off with radiation, right? Which I'm doing, pick off with radiation, be very easy, and then go ahead and give her treatment and go from there. That's like, and she might live forever. I mean, who knows? Like sky's the limit. This patient here is nerve wracking, right? I'm gonna actually show you what happened with this patient, which is remarkable. But the bottom line is it's a very different scenario. So amount of cancer matters. It gives you kind of a feel for room for error, right? This patient, if I'm wrong, and wrong is a strong word, but let's say my first treatment doesn't work, right? I've got room for error. This patient's tumor can grow. I'm still good. We can still take care of this, right? We, I should say collectively, the patient, me and their family, all their caregivers, we are still good. We have room to fail, right? There's room for error. This patient over here, there's no room to fail. You don't get this right the first time, you're done. You don't get a second chance, right? That's, you're probably not gonna get a second chance. So that's how I think, right? That's what I look at. And I wrote an entire article on this. You can see it on biopharmatron.com. It's called Quarterback and Patient's Care. No one on the planet has written an article like that. Zero, not a single oncologist. No one's written an article like that. And what I did is I basically put you inside my head and I said, hey, this is what I think about. This is what I look for. You are very different than the person next to you. And tumor burden matters. The amount of cancer matters. The location matters. If this thing is in the brain, it's very different than if it's not. Brain metastases terrify me. They're always a problem. And they're a problem because the vast majority of our treatments do not get into the brain. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So that's why they're a problem, right? We're really reliant on radiation to treat those. I don't like it when my patients have brain mets. I feel like I lose a little bit of control. I hate it, absolutely hate it. When it's in the bones, it matters because we give certain treatments to protect the bones from fractures. So that matters. If it's in the organs, it matters, right? If it's restricted to the liver, you might see me use something called Y90. It's like radioembolization, a little outside the box in breast. I don't do it very much in breast, but it's something I would consider, right? There's nothing I won't consider for my patient. I'm outside the box the minute we start because they have stage four breast cancer. Yes, I use conventional therapy. You're going to see me talk about it in a second, but I'm immediately thinking, how do I do better? How do I do better? Because these patients are theoretically incurable. So I'm not accepting that answer. I don't like the notion that they're theoretically incurable. I want to move on. I want to move on. I want to figure something out. Let's do something different, right? Let's figure something out. It's not good enough. Patient's going to die five years from now. I don't care. That's not good enough, right? So let's think outside the box. Now, one thing I want you, and so one, let's say this too, this is important. Where your disease is, seeing your pictures helps you understand your symptoms, right? Let's say you tell me you have pain in the bones, okay? Let's say you have pain in your back. Well, if you've got a cancer spot there and you see it on your image, that explains it, right? You're like, okay, I understand it. Like if you don't see your images, how the hell do you know if it's your cancer or not? And I will tell you this, I will say very clearly, in fact, I'll tell you this, you need to ask your physician to see your scans. If you have stage four cancer, you may not want to see your scans. I get it. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. I told me, I, well, I don't understand it because I will actually, let me take a step back. I want to say this really, important. this is really important. I tell my patients all the time, you can treat cancer every single day. You can see it every day. And I do. I think about cancer every day. I have two cancer companies, right? I'm building my own institute. I think about cancer every single day, almost every minute of every day. And I do not care. You can think about it every single day until you have cancer. You do not know what it's like to have cancer period. And so when I actually try very hard not to tell my patients, I understand, because I don't understand, they should be like, no, screw you. You have no concept of what this looks like. Yeah, you see pictures, but you have no idea what it's like to have cancer. And that's absolutely true. So I take it back. I do not understand. I never understand. With that said, I can appreciate why some patients don't want to see their pictures, right? Sometimes ignorance is bliss. I totally get that and appreciate it. But I would encourage you to make your physician show your scans. I want to talk about this for a second. This is important. I've directed many, many cancers, I've seen a lot of great doctors. But because of time constraints, a lot, a lot of physicians don't show patients their scans. In addition, I actually know doctors don't even look at them, period. They don't even look at them, right? They look at your report. The report says there's a progressive disease. They have no idea what your cancer actually looks like. And I would say that's a considerable amount of people. You'd be shocked. They don't even look at it. I even know a surgeon, and, and, I, and this is shocking to me, I know a surgeon doesn't look at the pictures before they operate, right? How do you know what the heck you're operating without looking at the pictures, right? And so that's, it's only seen that one time. So please don't take that and go run with it. I'm not gonna tell you who that was anyways. But the bottom line is 
you have to, have to, have to, as a doctor, look at the pictures. How do you know if your patient's symptoms are related to the cancer or not without knowing where the hell the cancer is? You haven't looked at it. The, the report can only tell you so much. You need to look at the pictures. In addition, I will say this, this happens a lot, right? Sometimes you'll get a patient's report, okay? And it'll say there's a new spot in the lung. And the doctor, without looking at the report, will say, okay, I want a biopsy of the lesion. Well, okay. So they go to interventional radiology to get a biopsy of the lesion. Well, look, there's a big problem there. If this cancer, you can see here, is in the middle of the lung, right? What happens is the interventional radiologist who you sent the patient to to get the biopsy will say, hey, I can't get to that without puncturing the lung, right? So the interventional radiologist is going through the skin, has to go through the lung to get to the spot. Well, if it's in the middle of the freaking lung, you're going to puncture the lung. Like, it's crazy. So now you've wasted your patient's time. You just lost a week or two, right? Because you referred the patient to interventional radiology for the biopsy. Now it took a week to get the appointment. The interventional radiologist says, oops, sorry, I can't do it. And that's lucky if you get lucky and get the appointment within a week, which should happen, by the way. But if you don't, so now the interventional radiologist says, hey, I can't do it. Now they come back to you. Now you say, okay, I need to get the pulmonologist involved because now you go to endoscopic bronchial ultrasound. Ultrasound, you go down through the throat and biopsy that way. Now you lose another week and maybe you lose another two weeks. You're losing time, right? And so I always tell patients cancer doesn't typically grow by the day. Of course, some do. It's extremely rare. So a day doesn't matter. But months matter. You can't lose months of time, right? That's garbage. And so if your physician's not looking at the actual scans, it can actually cost you time. And it's a very big problem. And I've never actually said this out, out loud like this. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous when doctors don't look at scans. I think it's a problem when they don't show their patients their scans. Patients should see their scans of what they're paying money for. They should see their PET scan. They should understand what's happening to them. And they should know are they responding or not? Like I show patients all the scans. I show them before and after. I show them even before, after, and after, and after. I've shown patients literally this, this like this week. I showed patients a series of scans over like a year and a half, like five different pictures in a row, showing them what's been going on with their disease, every single spot in their disease. So they understand why they're feeling the way they are, understand where we are, understand what we're doing with treatment, understand why I'm biopsying what I'm biopsying. That is incredibly important. So a couple things happen when you ask this to your scans. Number one, it helps you because you get to see where the disease is. Number two, you get to find out if your doctor actually looks at your scans, right? Because a lot of them don't. And so you'll find out if they're fast at using it. You can see how good they are on, this, on the imaging. You'll be able to see if they actually look at the scans, right? And not only that, but if they don't, now you're making it. And that's always good for you. Now you're making them look at the, look at the scans. Now, I want to be a little careful here. If your doctor doesn't look at scans, it doesn't mean they're not a great doctor. They could be a great doctor and not look at scans. I still think they could be better, right? I don't think that's an ideal scenario. So I think they could be, if they're great now, they could be phenomenal, right? If they looked at scans. I think you have to, have to, have to look at scans. And as a patient, you need to see it. And you can see why right here. These patients both have stage four melanoma, but very different scenarios. All right, so please read this article. You have to know your opponent. This is an article I wrote called Quarterback and Patients Care. It's Cancer Care. It's on, on biopharmaturn.com. You have to know your opponent. You have to understand this cancer to really have the patient do optimally. Now, one thing to understand when you're trying to understand the cancer rate right, is that cancer can have very different growth rates. So I always tell people this. This is important, really important, actually. When you take a stage four cancer, right? Stage four cancer is not created equal. It lives on a continuum. There's this big continuum of aggressiveness. There are some stage four breast cancers that are explosive, man, nothing you do works. And you're like, what is this? Like, what the hell is going on, right? And there's so much we don't understand, but it pisses me, like, you know, I, I care a lot about my patients, like insanely so, and my patients will tell you that, people that know me will tell you that. And so it pisses me off. I get, I get viscerally angry when this happens, right? But there are some patients we do scans and just everything just explodes. I have a guy with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I'm losing. That's not a cancer I should lose people. Because awesome. Okay, there we go. Better. Yeah, okay. Are you on my back now? Oh, am I back now? Yes, you're back. Good. Sorry, guys, about that. Somehow I got frozen there for a second. So the bottom line is I have a patient with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. That's a disease that's highly curable, 60% of the time plus, right? And I gave him RCHOP and I gave him polycystin BR because he's not a transplant candidate. I gave him tafacitumab, revlimid, nothing's working. Zero, nothing's working, right? Some it's kind of working, not working. And so now he wants to, to stop, right? Because he's, you know, it's, it's awful. And so we're going hospice and that pisses me off. Like I'm viscerally angry, but that patient is over here. 
Like somehow along this diffuse large B-cell lymphoma continuum, he's got disease we don't understand. There's something about his disease we don't get. Why is it growing in an uncontrolled way? Why is it doing this, right? As opposed to another patient who you give RCHOP, they're cured, they're fine. That's a very different place on this continuum. Similarly, if you've got stage four colon cancer, stage four breast cancer, stage four lung cancer, you're going to be somewhere on this continuum for your stage four disease. Your job is to figure out where you are on the continuum. Actually, my job is to figure out where you are on the continuum. And the way to do that, right, is you need multiple time points. It's not snapshots. I always tell people, not snapshots, trends. Trends, not snapshots, right? It's not about today, okay? Today gives you a picture, but you need the story. And the story comes through the next scan. And it comes through the next scan. And it's really how you put that story together. Please go read that article. You'll see me put that story together in front of you and how I do it. But the bottom line is you need to need to need to understand where you are in this continuum. It matters. And you need to really appreciate that stage four cancer is a continuum. You are not like anyone else. You may have aggressive stage four cancer. You may have really slow growing aggressive stage four, stage four lung cancer, stage four cancer. That matters. It changes everything, right? Everything depends on this. You can kind of get a feel for, okay, how much room do I have to fail? Again, I'm always thinking worst case scenario. That's my job as the doctor, right? You don't know, need me when things are going well. You need me when things are awful. You need me always to think about the next plan. What's the contingency plan? That's what I teach every fellow. Every resident that comes to me that I teach, I'm always like, what's your backup plan? What happens if this doesn't go well? It's always, 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 always. What's the contingency? And so if I have room to fail, that's a very different scenario than if I don't. If the cancer grows slow, suggest I have room to fail. If the cancer grows fast, I don't have room to fail. It's a very different scenario. In addition, with patients with stage four cancers, particularly stage four pancreatic, sometimes stage four colon, Treatment breaks are the holy grail. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of the time we'll give treatment indefinitely, right? We see patients on chemo, 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 we, and we do it because we're worried that if we take the chemo off, the cancer will grow. Absolutely. It makes sense. We all do it. I do it. Everyone does it. Okay. But if there's a chance that you can give the patient a treatment break, that's the holy grail where you can say, okay, I think we're in good shape right now. Let's get you a couple months off chemo, right? And I'm always thinking, what's the risk of that? Am I going to jeopardize where we are doing that? Am I messing with well enough? Am I going to cause a problem here? But treatment breaks are the holy grail. Now, I don't, I'm not saying people should have treatment breaks, right? I'm saying occasionally they, we do this in pancreatic cancer. I really try to get treatment breaks. In colon cancer, I do maintenance because it's pretty simple. I don't oftentimes do treatment breaks. In breast cancer, I don't, oftentimes, I don't generally actually don't do treatment breaks in general. But occasionally in certain cancers, you might strive for a treatment break because you can't give someone pulfurinox forever. It's too challenging. That's a regimen we use in pancreatic cancer. But the bottom line is sometimes tre the treatment breaks are a holy grail and understanding someone's cancer can really help with that. And I will say a lot of the time what happens is a patient will say to us, you know, or say to me, Bassam, listen, Bassam, Bassam is my first name. Bassam, you know, I, I, I'm in trouble here. I can't keep doing chemo. I need a break. And so if I understand their cancer, I know what the risk benefit ratio of that break is. That really, really, really helps, right? It's why I prefer PET scans. So, you know, in breast cancer, actually, NCCN guidelines, our national guideline network, does not say that you should get a PET scan, right? And so insurance companies use this on me all the freaking time. So they say you should do a CT and a bone scan. So a CT and a bone scan is equal to a PET scan in terms of looking at the disease. So PET scan costs me. So obviously insurance doesn't want to pay for it. But I like PET scans. Why do I like PET scans? Because sometimes what happens in cancer is you can kill a tumor and the tumor, the mass doesn't go away. It's dead tissue. But the PET scan will tell you how viable it is. It'll light up if it's viable, if it used to before, and it won't light up if it's not viable, right? So that sometimes, and that, that helps a lot, right? Because when you come to me with a treatment break and I can look at that spot and if it lights up, it's suggesting it's viable cancer. That's a very different scenario than if it doesn't light up. If it doesn't light up, I'm much more comfortable giving you a treatment break, right? Because I'm like, okay, cancer doesn't look like it's that active right now. That seems like a much better scenario for us. If it's lighting up on me, that's a problem, right? That's a concern. You're like, okay, if we come off, it's going to explode on us. So I like PET scans a lot more than I like CTs and bone scans. If you can get a PET scan with stage four breast cancer, please do not. Please understand. PET scans are not useful in every single type of tumor. So in a PET scan, we get someone labeled sugar. Okay. And the idea is that cancer cells divide more often than normal cells. They need more sugar for energy. Because in, in, so in theory, the tracer should go to the cancer cells preferentially, right? But there are some cancer cells that don't really take up the, tra take up the tracer, some cancers. Some, a lot of colon cancers don't, although so a lot of colon cancers do, but the general thought is that a lot of colon cancers don't. So PET scans aren't routinely done there. 
Rectal cancer is very similar. Pancreatic cancer, very similar. So there are some diseases where we do not routinely do PET CT. So please don't take this and say, Dr. Bullish, you should do a PET CT. No, in breast cancer, I like PET CTs. Okay. And in, in addition, please don't go and say, Dr. Bullish said you should do a PET CT regardless, because CT and bone scan is, is actually the expert consensus, right? But I prefer PET scans. I always try and get them. And again, ask to see your scans. Now, we definitely can see different treatment responses in patients. So as I told you before, when I'm seeing a patient, I'm trying to understand their cancer, their cancer. No one else's. I don't care about anyone else in that moment. I only care about them in that room, right? So I'm trying to understand their cancer. So where was their cancer located? What's their protein expression profile? What's the molecular profile? How's it behaving? Did it grow super fast from the last scan? Is it responding to treatment properly? The response matters. So you can see here in this case, right? This patient here has a great response to the treatment we gave her. So this is three months later. You can see the disease is gone in the liver. You can see that here in, in panel B. You can see this lymph node is gone. It's beautiful, right? This is a great response. Very happy. She's in a complete remission. This is actually kidneys. That's normal. There's no cancer on her picture. That's a great response. Now take this patient. She has triple negative breast cancer. We treated her up front. Her lymph nodes got better. So the armpit lymph nodes were better, right? Her breast mass, which I didn't show here, got better, okay? This pelvic mass got better in part because we also radiated this. We did radiation here but got better. But look at the liver. The liver got a little bit worse. Look at these two spots here. Okay. So now it matters, right? Why does it matter? Well, if I keep her on the same treatment, I might be winning in certain locations like the armpit. I might be winning or we might be winning in the pelvic bone, but we are losing in the liver and I am done. I don't like losing and neither does my patient. So we change our treatment right? So the treatment responses matter. And I want you to ask your physician to show you your pictures. They're going to hate me for saying it. I do not care. I only care about people and patients. That's why I'm doing this series, spending all this time because I only care about people, right? And so the idea here is I want you to look at your pictures. I want to, I want you to look at your pictures. I want them to show it to you. Okay. So you're constantly adjusting on the fly. You get a new scan. Now you're assimilating that information saying, okay, what do I do next? Always, always adjusting on the fly. Every time I see a patient, I'm adjusting on the fly. Let's say they have too much nausea. They can't handle the treatment. Their counts are too low. You're constantly adjusting. Nothing is static in cancer, or at least it shouldn't be. If everything is static in cancer, you're probably doing it wrong. Choice of weapon matters. We have different treatments. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Show cancer it has something it hasn't seen. So if you take this patient, for example, who's grown in the liver, you're not going to show the patient the same exact thing you've been doing. It doesn't make any sense, right? So you're going to take something else that attacks the cancer in a different way. I'll talk about in a moment. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's kind of an underlying philosophy, right? This patient here doing very well. She's on maintenance treatment now. Why would I change it? She's doing awesome, right? So the last thing in terms of building out your personalized journey, then we're going to really start talking details, is that you matter, right? You don't, you don't get to like not be part of this equation, right? I can only do so much as your physician. I can give you the treatments and, and then you know, watch to make sure you're safe. But you're a huge part of this equation, right? You have a very significant impact on how you do. I think a lot of people discount this, but it's it's a reality, right? So you need to do exercise. Just standard stuff. Don't go crazy, but just, you know, get out there. Don't be sedentary. Nutrition matters, but not in the way that people think. You know, I think there's still a lot of data on this that we need to accumulate. The our, One of our big guideline centers just said, look, there's not enough information recently. They just stated this nationally or internationally. We don't have enough information to really make any sort of statements on nutrition. But the bottom line is you should have a relatively reasonable diet. Don't go, don't go, I guess don't go to extremes, right? You know, moderation is always reasonable. Don't go to extremes. I think that's important. There's a lot of studies ongoing with nutrition. I'm not discounting the importance of nutrition and cancer. I've seen some incredible stuff with nutrition and cancer. I'm not discounting any of that. I will just simply say, I do not know what I do not know, right? And so we'll see what these studies show. Compliance matters. You know, if your doctor says you got to do something, you got to do it. You know, I will say this. In life, not just in cancer, in life, in any job you have, I'm a big believer in controlling the variables. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're trying to figure out why people aren't coming to your lecture, right, and you change 10 things at once, well, you don't really know what worked and what didn't, right? You have no idea. You want to do kind of make one change at a time. Similarly with cancer. If you've got a patient who's on, you know, not, not doing great, let's say they're not doing great, you're not going to start 10 drugs at once. You won't know what's working, what's not, right? You want to really control the variables. And compliance matters because if you're not compliant, you're not taking the medicine, that's a variable I can't account for, right? I want to know if a drug's working. I give you a drug, right? And I want to see if it's working for your cancer, but you don't take it. Well, that's a pretty big introduce, introduction of a pretty big variable, right? Now I don't know, well, was it didn't work because you didn't take it the way I wanted you to? Maybe let's say you took it every other day. You took it once in a while. Well, now I don't know if the drug didn't work because you didn't take it the way I needed you to or it just didn't work, right? That's a variable you can't have. Another variable that some people introduce, they ask me all the time about is supplements, right? I 
Mm, we'll be a little careful here. I'm not a big fan of supplements. And the reason why is because they introduce variables. Again, I don't know what I don't know. And certainly when patients have no other options, I'm all for whatever they want to try. But when they introduce a supplement in the context of what I'm trying to do, that's a variable I can't account for, which is why I hate supplements, right? If the liver enzymes go up, let's say the liver goes crazy. Is it because they took the supplement or because the drug did that? I have no idea. So controlling the variables, keeping a clean picture is so important in cancer. And part of that is dependent on your compliance. Vigilance. You got to stay vigilant. You can't take anything for granted. You know, I've had patients who had highly curable tumors. We were winning. Their cancer was, was gone, right? They sat on a fever, came too late, couldn't help them. In fact, this particular patient, though, it was the ER. The, anyway, I won't talk about that. But the bottom line is, you know, when all is said and done, you have to take everything seriously. You got to, every temperature you have, every fever, it matters when you're getting chemo. It matters. You can't blow it off. Got to tell your doctor, you got to call them. I don't care if they get pissed. Call them day or night. That's why my patients have a cell phone. Like it, it, it's cancer doesn't care. Temperatures don't care, right? You got to be vigilant about your side effects. You have an issue with side effects, don't wait. You have a little bit of blood in your cough, you got to call about that. That can become disastrous. You got to call about that. You got to be vigilant. You can never call too much, but you can call too little. I always tell my patients that. You can never call me too much. You're never going to piss me off. You piss me off, you need to find a new doctor. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? You can never call too much, but you can call too little. And the last thing I'll say is remember you're the captain. I always tell my patients this, right? I'm the navigator, but they're the captain. My job is to give them the options, including doing nothing, right? That's always an option, right? And I kind of say, okay, here's the risk benefit ratio. Here's the juice squeeze ratio. We'll talk about this in a moment. And you know, it's their decision, right? I'm the navigator, they're the captain. And so that's really crucial. So this is a beautiful, beautiful talk, a beautiful series on fighting for inches. I will skip this for now, just in the interest of time. But Al Pacino does this amazing, amazing series on, on fighting for inches. And now, hold on, now I'm stuck. Okay. Okay. So I'm a big believer in, in the fact that the inches matter in cancer, right? You can see an entire lecture I gave on YouTube on this. I think 7,000 roughly people have watched that. But you can go watch that if you want. But the inches in cancer matter. Little details, they matter. I mean, details can be the difference between winning and losing. It matters. So now we're going to really build the journey. And we're really going to focus on these two patient populations here, the patients who are estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor positive, HER2 negative, or estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, low HER2 positive. So we talked about this before. I'm not going to recap this, but I do want to talk about HER2 for a second. Now we talked about HER2, right? But I didn't really tell you how we decide which box you're in. So the way that we decide if you're HER2 positive or low HER2 positive right here, low HER2 positive or HER2 positive is as follows. So we kind of do what's called immunohistochemistry. We take an antibody and we stain your cancer cells. And we stain it for HER2. So we can see in this upper panel A that this person does not make any HER2. So they're HER2 zero by IHC, by immunohistochemistry. So it's zero, right? Next to them is one plus. It's a little arbitrary, but they're one plus. They make a little bit. You can see a little bit of brown here, right? In this panel C, that's two plus. Okay, there's there's more there. You can see a, you know more protein here, more brown stain, right? And then in this D panel, that's a lot. That's three plus. We call that three plus. That patient has a lot of HER2 expression. Okay, what does it matter? Why does it matter? Well, if you're HER2 zero, then you're considered HER2 negative. If you're HER2 one plus, you used to be considered HER2 negative. Now you're considered low HER2 positive. That's a change. You need to remember that. You would be considered low HER2 positive now. And that's the new nomenclature. So I want you to go ask your physician if you are really HER2 negative, if they said that to you before, or if you are low HER2 positive. I need you to understand that no matter what cancer you have, actually colon, rectum, breast, esophageal, gastric, all of it, because there's trials looking at this stuff, or there's going to be, right? So I want you to know that. If you're three plus at the bottom here, like in this panel D, then you're considered positive. You're positive by the old nomenclature and the new nomenclature. Now, let's talk about the people who are two plus in this panel C. If you're two plus for the antibody stain, okay, then we do fish. We do something called fluorescent ice in situ hybridization. We test your cells for how many copies of the HER2 gene they have, right? So if they have a lot of copies in the HER2 gene, those would be pink. They'd be in red here. So this panel on the right bottom corner, they have a lot of copies of HER2 gene. So they'd be fish positive, okay? If they don't, and these green ones are not HER2, this, that's the control. If they don't, then they're considered HER2 negative, or sorry, fish negative, okay? So if you're in this panel C, you're two plus with antibody standing. We decide if you are HER2 positive or negative. We used to, and I'll talk about this in a second. We decide if you're HER2 positive or negative by looking at fish. This was the old way, okay? So you're fish negative and you were HER2 2 plus, 
that meant you were HER2 negative. If you were FISH positive, as in this bottom right-hand panel, and you were HER2 2 plus, you were FISH positive. So look here on the left in the old way. In the old way, 2 plus, FISH negative, in the middle here was HER2 negative. The old way, HER2 2, 2 plus, FISH positive was HER2 positive. Now, the new way, the new way is the same, except if you were HER2 2, 2 plus with the antibody state, and you're FISH negative, now you are low HER2 positive. That is the change. Really, really, really important. Critically important. Okay, so let's start building the map for these patients. Well, okay, we know that these patients are generally incurable. So how do I go about doing this? Well, I think about all my options in this comment-based algorithm you see at the top. I think about conventional options. So what are the options that are available to me that are already FDA approved? I think about operational options. So are there surgical options that are available? I think about molecular-based options. So when I test your molecular profile, is there anything that I can garner from that that I can use to target your cancer in a unique way? And then I look at trials. Clinical trials are critically important. We're going to talk about this in a second. And I look at everything else, like radiation. Is radiation useful? Is something called Y90 useful? So the idea here is I don't think that cancer patients have an expiration date. You don't walk in my room, in my patient room, with an expiration label. I do not think that way. I'm not thinking about you dying. I'm thinking about how do I keep you alive with very good quality of life. That's all I am thinking about. Okay, so I want you to play chess, not checkers. And you need your doctor to do the same thing. And we're going to build you a personalized treatment map personalized treatment map, right? So you have these conventional options in yellow, clinical trial options here, molecular studies in blue, local regional options next to it. And you're building the treatment map. You're saying, okay, I think drug alpha is best based on the amount of data here, blah, blah, blah. And then you're saying, okay, I would use conventional option A, then I would do trial again. That's what I want to be doing with you. Now, how do we build that? Well, before we get there, I want to talk about the notion that in stage four disease, okay, in general, but really in incurable diseases, we use a first line option depicted here until someone progresses on it or they can't tolerate it. Then we go to second line and then third line and so on and so forth. So how do we decide if we need to make a change? How do we decide if someone's progressed? The way we do it is a, in multiple ways. Number one, we look, do a physical exam, right? If there's something obvious that's growing and we biopsy, it's clearly that you, things have gotten worse. That's obvious, right? We do imaging. Imaging is very important, right? So here I'm showing you what I've shown patient, my patient before, right? My patient allowed me to show this. You can see that panel A is when the disease started. Then we treated them three months later, the disease was gone. Again, this wasn't a PET scan, was a patient, the patient was somebody else's before they became mine later. But you can see the disease got worse, right? So it got better, right? The, all the, this mass got better, all the masses got better. The patient's actually complete remission in panel B. Panel C, the disease came back with a slim node. Panel D, the patient now has a new effusion, like a new fluid collection outside of the lung between the pleura and the lung, right? But between the pleural layer, sorry, the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, not so between those two layers. Now you see the disease has gotten worse. Fortunately for this patient, if I showed you panel E, they're back in a complete remission. We live back in a complete remission. It's excellent. But this is how we make these assessments, right? So from panel A to panel B, things look amazing. You're not changing, okay? Panel B to panel C, you're changing. Things look a little worse. Panel C to panel D, you're changing. Disease got worse. That's how we decide if we need to change based on imaging. So I like to do PET scans every three months in my breast cancer patients. I do a CT and bone scan if insurance pushes back on them, okay? But I fight like hell. We have some insurance scan, by the way. I always do that. Anyways, another thing we look at is cancer markers. So a lot of breast cancers will make proteins that they can secrete into the blood. And then you can follow those proteins in the blood to see how things are going, right? So some of these proteins, C15-3, C2129. Some doctors not, do not believe in it. They're not wrong. I like to do it. I like to follow the disease in multiple ways. You are eventually going to hear about something called cell-free DNA. DNA that's being secreted by the cancer cell into the blood. We'll be able to follow that in the future. That's still a little bit early. Certainly no reason for physician to be doing that now, but that will be coming. So look at this patient. This is a patient of mine who came to me right here at the peak of their C15-3, the peak of their disease. This is the cancer market. It was at the highest. Like, you know, this is when their disease was the worst. They had gone to some interesting clinic. I won't say where they gave them this regimen I would never even conceive of. None of my colleagues would conceive of. It was really strange. Okay, anyways, disease actually was relatively well controlled, but anyways, not great. Then they got this treatment, which also, you know, none of this is great. Never saw a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Just really odd when they had hormone receptor positive or two negative disease. Just odd, odd, odd all the way around. Then they saw another center, they gave them Taxol. And now they came to me, disease is awful. I, I know that I only have one shot at this. So I said, okay, look, I know that I'm not going to extend overall survival. Survival is not better using two drugs instead of one in breast cancer. And so I'll talk about this in a second, but really in breast cancer, all the chemotherapies are essentially created equal, you know, and, and so 
They don't really matter which one you choose. You can choose two versus one if you want a higher response rate, but it doesn't really confer like extended overall survival. It doesn't matter that much. Bottom line is I used two drugs instead of one here because I knew I was in trouble. And so she did great. You see a 15.3 come down right away. And so it's pretty amazing. Now, I want to talk about clinical trials. Clinical trials are critically important. I'm a huge believer in them. I've done you know, almost 100. I run two national clinical trials for a company called X Biotech right now. They are experiments designed to save lives. We talked about this last time. I want you to go back to the other lecture and watch about clinical trials. But the bottom line is they provide hope where there was none. The very first moment you hear you have a stage four cancer that's incurable, the next question out of your mouth is what clinical trials are available to me. The very next question. You don't pass go. It's a reflex. You tell me I have stage four incurable cancer. My next statement is what trials are available to me, okay? Constantly ask your oncologist, have they changed? Is there anything new? Go to clinicaltrials.gov if you want to see the trials yourself. You can actually follow it yourself. We talked about building your personalized journey through molecular profiling. So another reflexive question. When your doctor says you have stage four, blah, blah, blah. Say stage four breast cancer, stage four colon cancer. First question, what clinical trials are out there? Second question, what's my molecular profile? What's my NGS, my pd one my TMB, my MSI, my HRD? That's it, boom. Two questions right away. I don't care, right? Just ask them right away. Another thing, what's my scans look like, right? So can we talk about this? But look at this. Here's a patient who got a lap rib because they had a BRCA2 mutation in their breast cancer, okay? Look at the disease, much better in the right breast. You can see that here, right? These little spots in the lungs getting better, right? This spot here in the lung getting better. So the patient was eligible for this drug, a lap rib, because they had this mutation. But you wouldn't have known about that mutation unless you went looking for it with the profiling I just told you. So we talked about immune therapy, and I like this slide. I like this picture a lot, but this is an immune system cell killing the cancer cell. And we look at these four things here. If you are tumor mutation burden, sorry, if you're PD-1 high, if you're MSI high, if you're MMR deficient, TMB high, ask your doctor about immune therapy. Now I want to be clear here. pd one does not matter right now in stage four breast cancer that's hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. It's really important for triple negative disease. Still though, I want you to ask your physician if you're high PD-L1 positive. At some point, they're gonna consider immune therapy because they might do it outside the box. I would, if I got desperate, I would use it outside the box. So please, please, please ask them about this. If you have any of these characteristics. MMR, we're gonna talk about a little bit later when we talk about rectal cancer. People have seen the New York Times thing. Actually, just go look at the last talk I gave to hear more about that, to hear about that New York Times rectal cancer article that everyone was talking about. I actually go through that in detail. But this is a very nice picture here. This comes from Rizal Kurzok's, Kurzrock's Twitter page. She's actually an expert in precision medicine throughout the world. So she had a patient here. She's showing a triple negative breast cancer patient, right, who had a high tumor mutation, but lots of mutations in the DNA, okay? They put them on immune therapy. Two months later, this big lymphadenopathy, lymph node enlargement is gone, right? So it looks really beautiful here. You can see this lesion here also gone. So very nice. And you can see 48 months later, four years later, the disease has not progressed. This patient is still in a complete remission. Amazing. But how would you know that if you didn't test for the DNA mutations, right? So it matters. It absolutely matters. So we're going to talk about being the juice being worth the squeeze, right? So every single time you think about what we do to you, you got to think to yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the benefit worth the risk? And I like this juice squeeze. I like it a lot. I saw it on the Girl Next Door movie. I've used it ever since. I stole it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Now, the idea is pretty simple. We talked about if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We don't practice insanity, right? Insanity, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We don't give you a freaking treatment if it's not working. It's stupid. We don't use a treatment as the same mechanism of action as the one that just failed. That's insipid too. We don't do that. We show the cancer something it hasn't seen yet. Be smart. Think about mechanism of action. That's how the drugs work, right? Think about how this drug works. How does it attack the cancer cell? What in this entire circle is it trying to target, right? And does it target in a different way? Is it moving a different way around the cancer, trying to show the cancer something different? Because what we had before didn't work, right? So we think about the different bullets in the gun. And I'm not a gun person, I promise you. But I think about the bullets in the gun, right? So you think, okay, as a doctor, when I see you, I'm like, what bullets do I have in the gun? Because I'm gonna try and get this cancer in multiple ways, right? So when we talk about the patients we were talking about today, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative or low HER2 positive. That's who we're talking about today. The bullets available to us in like in general, CDK4 inhibitors, other like an mTOR inhibitor, pick 3 c inhibitor, but this I kind of generalized here. But the bottom line is you want to know what bullets are in the gun so you can start to make this beautiful treatment map for patients, something I call treatment cartography. Okay, so let's talk about the bullets in the gun for patients who are hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, or low HER2 positive. Now we talk about the first shot we take. 
the first shot we take, the first line treatment. So here, shot one, okay? I'm gonna talk about what pretty much everybody does. So what Hello. everyone does is they use a CDK4-6 inhibitor, right? So they use a CDK4-6 inhibitor. That's a drug that targets cyclin-dependent kinase four and six, okay? And there's three different options here, Ibrantz, Kiskali, Versenia, okay? And they use endocrine therapy. So this is therapy that's designed to reduce the impact of estrogen on the protein, on the cell, right? So we talked about how these cells are estrogen dependent. They respond to estrogen, they grow in with estrogen. So we're using drugs to target that dependency, right? So this drug actually is what we call a selective estrogen receptor down regulator. It's degra degrader, sorry. It degrades the, the estrogen receptor so it's not there, right? So it can't see estrogen. These drugs basically block the production of estrogen from your fat cells, which you can talk about another day, we will at some point. But the bottom line is we combine one of these three drugs with one of these drugs, and that's typically the first shot we take, okay? Now, if there's a lot of disease in organs and we're really nervous, some people will go straight to chemotherapy, nothing wrong with that. Immediately ask about clinical trials. They might be, might be an amazing molecular-based option out there for you. And there might be some local regional things that your doctor might think about, maybe radiate one spot, something like that, but just leave that alone. The bottom line is this is the main thing that we all do, but don't be surprised if you hear a little bit about this. Now, the beauty of this regimen, where you take one of these drugs and mix it with one of these, is that it has a high juice to squeeze ratio. They work really well and they're not that risky, right? So the juice is great. They extend life quite well, right? But it's also great because the squeeze, the risk isn't that high. They're very well tolerated. They're all oral, except for if you use Facilex, that's intramuscular, right? The cycles are monthly. What do I mean by that? Well, we think about your treatment in cycles, right? I give you a month of treatment that's one cycle, right? And then I wanna know how things are going typically after three cycles. So I give you three months of treatment, I'm giving you three cycles of treatment, right? And then I scan you again to see if it's working, right? So that's how I assess. So scans are usually done every three cycles, every three months, right? So when we talk about the benefit, you can see this here. You can see that the response rate's pretty high for these drugs, for these regimens, on the order of 50 to 60%. That's pretty good in the cancer world. I know it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. When we look at the median time that people live, so 50% live beyond it, 50% people live less, you can see it's right around five years, right? Like four to five years. Now, I want you to take it with a grain of salt. I actually hate showing people these numbers. Hate it, hate it, hate it. I don't want you thinking about these numbers. Many people live a lot longer. We're doing much better with new treatments, but I'm showing this because I want patients to know everything. You're here because you want to know all the details. I'm giving them to you. You can pick and choose what you want. Fine. But the bottom line is, please take these numbers with a grain of salt. But the reason why we all love this is because you can see here that when compared to just using letters all alone or just using one treatment alone, when you use the combination, you can get an extension of roughly 10 months, eight to 10 months of not having the disease get worse, right? So these people had roughly two years where the disease did not get worse at all, right? On, on average. So that's pretty good. We are doing better. I promise we're working on doing better. But the bottom line is I wanted to show you this. So these treatments are highly effective like I just showed you. We use them until they stop working or you can't handle them. So just like I said, we use them until they stop working or you can't handle them. And this is actually a pretty good regimen. So let's talk a little bit about the details here. So CDK4-6 inhibitors, Ibrantz and Kiskali, two of the three, are given once daily, 21 days on, seven days off. Verzenio is given orally twice daily. You don't have to worry about these details. I'm just going to give you a general feel because you're here for this. I'm going to give you the general feel. Side effects, infection, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, hair loss is, is kind of possible. I don't see a lot of that when I give these drugs. You can see a reduction in your blood counts. Listen, these drugs are very well tolerated in general, but you have to be smart. Can't be stupid. You have a fever, you have potential infection, you got to let us know. This can't be dumb. Okay, you just gotta, gotta be vigilant. And dumb is not the right word, but you gotta, you can't, you can't be nonchalant. Okay, it, it matters, right? You can't be nonplussed. So endocrine therapy side effects, exomestine, so sorry, exomestine, arimidex, and fumar are the three aromatase inhibitors. They're depicted here. I will talk more about that in a future lecture, I promise, like what that actually means. But they're given orally daily, so really pretty safe drugs, incredibly safe drugs. We've been to hundreds of thousands of women probably now throughout the world, or yeah. So 10 to 20% of people get joint pains. They're reversible. You stop the drug, they go away. Not a huge deal. They suck when you have them. Absolutely terrible when you have them. But in theory, they should go away when you stop the drug. People can get gradual bone loss. We want patients on calcium and vitamin D. Okay, we think it's important. We check your bone density test every two years. We sometimes give you bone supporting drugs. Okay. In addition, you can have menopausal symptoms, hot flashes, mood swings, vaginal dryness, things of that nature. 
So, but generally very safe. Fast legs also very safe, but this is given monthly intramuscular, except for the first month where you get it every two weeks. The bottom line is again, menopausal symptoms, joint pains, some fatigue, like just generalized like nausea, things like that, but in general, very well tolerated. Okay, so how do we assess response? And actually these are patients of mine, right? Um, this patient here, I just already showed you, this actually is a triple negative breast cancer patient. Three months after they got chemo, we talked about how they got a little bit worse, so we're changing her treatment. But look at this patient. I want you to see this patient for a second. This is important. So this patient, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. We gave them Ibrand Sifamar. Look, three months after treatment, all of that bone stuff I showed you earlier, all of it is essentially gone, right? So she's in a complete remission three months later, super easy treatment, handling it just fine. Kidneys, these are kidneys that's normal uptakes. Don't worry about that. That's normal. So she's doing awesome, right? So this patient's going to stay on Ibrantum Pomara. This patient with triple negative breast cancer is going to need a change in her treatment. Okay, so that's how we would decide. So let's say you progress. So at some point, you, you might progress. Might, disease might get worse. So I'm always thinking, okay, what's the backup plan, right? What's plan two? So here's second line. So now in second line, we typically you decide how what treatment you're going to get depending on what if you have a pic 3 c mutation or not. Okay, so we talked about this. 40% of women have a pic 3 c mutation in their cancer. You need to know this. If you have a mutation, you're likely to get a drug called Picre and Fastelex. If you do not, you may get a drug called Affinitor with one of these other options here, okay? That's really important to know. Again, people might use chemotherapy, clinical trials. Again, you need to ask about clinical trials. If there's a clinical trial, by all means, go on the clinical trial, right? If there's a clinical trial better than what the standard care is, by all means, go on. Talk to your oncologist about it. But these are kind of the classic options. So we talk about shot two. So now we're at second bullet, okay? Shot two, right? Approximately 40% of women eligible for pick rate and fast legs because they have this mutation. Shot two, like I said, depends on if you have the mutation. If positive, we use pick rate plus fast legs. If negative, we use the other regimen I just showed here. This has a lower uh, juice to squeeze ratio. It's a little lower than first line. It's not bad by any means, but it's a little bit lower. I'll show that to you in a second. Clinical trials are so important, guys, please please, please. Reflex. Clinical trial. Every time you're in the office, clinical trial, clinical trial. I don't care if your physician gets annoyed. The point of this is for you to be the best advocate you can. Clinical trial, clinical trial, clinical trial. Okay. So pick ray. It's a pick 3 ca inhibitor. We talked about that. It's given orally once a day. This drug is a little tough to tolerate sometimes. I promise you. Fatigue, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, elevated sugars, hair loss is possible, rash. Some people get urinary tract infection. It's still some well, somewhat well tolerated, but it can be a challenge. Just talk to your physician of symptoms. They can reduce the dose. They can adjust on the fly. Nothing here is static. It's all malleable, but we can't help you if you don't tell us what is going on. Everolimus, different sort of treatment, orally once a day, can cause swelling, a rash, stomatitis, kind of like this breakdown of the skin around the mouth. You can get GI symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, infection, respiratory issues, you can have a cough, things of that nature. So again, you know, a little bit more toxic, a little tougher to handle, and not as effective. You can see here that it basically buys people roughly four months on average of not having the disease get worse. This other treatment, the PICRE and fast and FASTX, gives people about six months on average of not having the disease like progress, which is good. We take that, we take whatever we can get, but we clearly need to do better. And doing better, clinical trial, clinical trial, molecular profiling, right? So that's how we think. So again, we do the same response assessment. And if you progressed, we go to third line treatment. So what's the third shot in the gun look for, like for patients like you? The third bullet, and I'm sorry I'm talking about guns. I'm not a big fan of guns, I promise you. But it just made sense in terms of the analogy. And so the way we decide about shot three is going to be if you are low HER2 positive or if you're HER2 negative. Remember, every patient we're talking about now, they make either the estrogen receptor or the progesterone receptor or both, okay? We're gonna talk about patients later that do not fit that mold. Now we're saying, okay, were you low HER2 positive? Were you HER2 one plus by the antibody with fish positive? Or fish, sorry, yeah, fish negative, fish negative. Sorry, sorry, one plus, one plus, or you were two plus and fish negative. That's low HER2 positive, okay? So low HER2 positive, you would be a great candidate for NHER2, great drug. HER2 negative, most people are gonna do chemotherapy. Some people might do endocrine therapy, like hormonal therapy. Most people do chemotherapy. Again, clinical trials, molecular-based options. It's so important. So let's run through this for a moment. So we have to know if you're low HER2 positive. We give you NHER2 if you're low HER2 positive. If not low HER2 positive, you're likely to get chemotherapy. And the juice to squeeze ratio is actually variable here. For chemo, it's not perfect, but it's not awful. We'll talk about it in a second. For NHER2, it's a great juice to squeeze ratio. Really good data. And I'm showing that here now. You can see the response rate, 53% if you're low HER2 positive. Great, great drug. You got to know if you're low HER2 positive. You got to talk to your doctor. 
it matters so much. The drug will get approved soon. I almost promise, I guarantee it. Guarantee it. The FDA is looking at it right now. It will get approved soon, okay? For this indication, it's already approved for other stuff. You can see here, it gave people five months without the disease coming back on average, extended life by six months. Again, not perfect. We know that we're trying to do better. I have a lot of really smart, talented colleagues who are working on this, right? So we're working on it. Chemotherapy, about a 20% response rate, not awful. We use lots of chemos here. There's like 15 plus chemos. So please know that. So when we talk about NHER2, very safe drug. It's given intravenously once every three weeks. Possible side effects. Hair loss is possible. I don't see a lot of that. Heart issues in less than 8%. The big thing is you can get lung issues called interstitial lung disease. Nine to 10% of people, it's pretty rare. This is a very good drug, very safe. Chemotherapy, over 15 options. The type of chemotherapy matters. They attack the cancer in different ways. If you one chemotherapy doesn't work, you can use a different chemotherapy that attacks cancer in a different way, right? That's important, okay? But we will talk about chemotherapy much more in the future. We'll talk about all the chemotherapies in triple, triple negative breast cancer, but the side effects vary depending on chemo. So again, response assessment, like we talked about, and then we'll end with the fourth line, fourth line plus. Fourth line plus for patients that have progressed on the first three lines, so now we're here, is generally going to be chemo, okay? And so with chemo, we're really talking about a juice to squeeze ratio that's the lowest of all the lines because now you're later on in your disease, the cancer is more resistant, the juice to squeeze ratio goes down, but you still have a lot of hope, okay? I'm forced to have a hospice discussion here. I don't I mean, patients can get 15, I've seen patients get 15 lines of therapy. I'm only mentioning this here because I don't want to, for a moment, let anyone think that I don't think about the patient and I just give chemo, 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 chemo. We do kind of give people options, but I do think there's a lot of hope here. So I don't really talk about hospice here. I wouldn't talk about hospice for a long time and a patient is doing well, to be honest. I don't even know a line. Like I'm not thinking about a line of therapy. I mean, 10, 11, I don't know when I would think about hospice. So the last thing we'll talk about pretty much here is the location of your cancer matters. And this is any cancer, okay? If you have spots in the bone, and let's say you have a painful spot, you might hear your doctor talk about radiation. There's different options for radiation. If you, if you have spots in the bones, like in this patient, we're gonna use bone protective agents, okay? Unless there's a reason not to. The bone protective agents are an agent called Zometa, another one called Zidonosumab, otherwise known as XG. You're gonna hear about these. They'll also ask you to take calcium and vitamin D. Interesting study in the New England Journal just published recently showing that vitamin D doesn't actually help with bones. Very strange article. Uh, it was a good article. So anyways, just keep that in the back of your mind. But side effects of these drugs, you can see issues with the jaw. You can see a low calcium. You can actually get fractures in your femur, which is really weird, right? Like we're trying to prevent fractures, but actually cause fractures. It's a little bit unique. If you have brain meds, no matter the cancer, almost undoubtedly, you're going to get radiation of some sort, okay? A lot of the time we like to do localized pinpoint radiation. So that's stereotactic radio surgery or cyber knife. That's pinpoint radiation. We don't want to have to radiate the whole brain if we don't have to, right? Because radiating the whole brain can cause problems. But sometimes there's spots everywhere and you have to radiate the whole brain. That's pretty rare though. A lot of times now you can radiate 20 plus spots just doing pinpoint radiation. Surgery, usually not done in stage four diseases with some exceptions. And really I'm talking about breast cancer here. Stage four breast cancer surgery, not usually done. And then we try and find treatments that cross the blood barrier, right? If you can find a drug that gets into the brain, we want to use them, right? We don't want to just be relying on radiation. We want to use drugs that cross the blood barrier. Some of them like CDK4-6 inhibitors, NHER2, Zolota, Picray, they do actually cross those data. So this is the final journey, right? This kind of gives the patient who's hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative or low HER2 positive gives them a pretty classic journey based on consensus guidelines. This is not Dr. Gwili Bassam talking. This is everyone talking, right? This is kind of what people do. I like this, really think it's pretty cool. I'm going to publish, put it online for you guys to just take with you. And that's it. So concluding remarks, do not be shy. Be freaking loud. Advocate, right? You walk in the door, they tell you of stage four breast cancer. First question, clinical trials. Second question, molecular profile. Third question, show me my scan. Fourth question, what are we going to do, right? I want you to be loud. I want you to ask. I want you to advocate. I want you to know what's going on. The journey may be different, but the thought process is the same. And what I mean by that is you're watching me talk about stage four HER2, well, sorry, stage four hormone receptor positive, either HER2 negative or lower HER2 positive breast cancer. You heard me talk about that. Some of the details are really strictly confined to those individuals, okay? They're, they're dependent on the specific to those individuals. But please know the thought process I just went through. Everything I just showed you, that's for everyone with stage four cancers, everybody. This thought process is the same. And this is an optimal thought process. It took me 
decades to come to this thought process and to put it down on paper, really figure out how to put it down on paper in this article called I'm Playing Chess Against Cancer, which I, I wrote for biofarmaturn.com. That took a long time, right? Inches matter, but there's lots of right ways. So, you know, doctors doing something different, they're probably not wrong, right? There's lots of right ways to do this. Sometimes the target's not that small, okay? Come back here for reference if you need it. I put this stuff on here. I didn't expect you to get all of it, right? I put it on here so you could come back. You could say, hey, what did that data show? What did it look like? What were those side effects that you talked about that I'm most likely going to feel? Go back, okay? Just go back. And that's all I have. So thank you for your time, everyone. Open to questions if anyone has them. Awesome. Um, Mel had one question for you um, about her two positive, the old way versus the new way. When was when was the new way determined? New way has always been out there, Mel, but it really didn't have clinical relevance until a paper, well, until a paper was published relatively recently in a presentation that was done a couple months ago, where they saw that NHER2, which targets the protein HER2, actually worked in people who were low HER2 positive. For years, people have been using HER2 targeting drugs in low HER2 patients, and they couldn't figure out a way to have them work, right? They weren't working. And so that was the key. And so what happened recently is they found, okay, and HER2 works in this population system. Now we really need to know if you're low HER2 positive before. Before it was just nice to know, I guess. It was like academic, but now it matters. It has an impact on your treatment. So that's what changed. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns, anything else I can address? So thank you everyone for coming. We will continue. We will finish up breast cancer for the next one to two episodes, and then I will move on to other stage four cancers. I'm available to anyone who needs me on LinkedIn. They can message me, direct message me, any questions you have. Thank you for your time. We will see you next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Boston. Thank think, you, Boston. I think Andrew has, Andrew? Oh, Andrew just saying bye. Okay. Well, just, just yeah, I was just saying bye, but I just want to say how much I uh, appreciate what Bassam's doing with this. It's, um, I'm, a, I'm a patient colorectal uh, stage four, and, um, yeah, just the information that is, that is given out is um, brilliant. So looking forward to the next, looking forward to the colorectal one. Okay, Andrew, I'll make sure Bassam knows. I think he got disconnected just before you had that to say. No, I, I'm, I'm here now. Okay. No, I'm here. Sorry, okay. I missed it. I, I disconnected my other computer. So, Andrew, you can't see me. But what's going on, bud? Yeah, well, I was just saying, Bassam, you know, we've, we've swapped a couple of messages on LinkedIn. And um, I just really appreciate all the um, everything you're doing with this. It's it's brilliant for me as a patient to, to learn, even though I'm colorectal stage four. You know, like you said, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of cross pathways with an information that I can use. Oh, we'll do stage four colorectal soon, Andrew. I've got you in mind, I promise, man. And I hate what you're going through. I think you're remarkable. I told you that online. You're an exceptional individual. Everything yeah. you do is exceptional. I really appreciate you being here and I'm with you all the time. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Bassam. Thanks, man. All right, guys. Thanks. Talk to you all later. Okay. Thank you, Bassam. Bye now. Yep, take care.